Hello. Hello there, everybody. Come on in here, Nick. Oh, hi. Sorry. Get oh. you in here. Welcome to another Wildfire live stream. Yeah. Thank you. Without further ado, let's let's hit it. Sit there in your heartache, waiting on some beautiful boy to save you from your old ways. You play forgiveness, watch it now. Here he comes. He doesn't look a thing like Jesus, but he talks like a gentleman, like you imagine when you were young. Falco. Hey there, Tom Thomas, good guy. Hey there, yeah, films. Hey, hey. Miguel's in the house. Let's do the intro super quick so we can bring them all in. All right. Uh, Miguel is a multifaceted filmmaker based out of Vancouver, BC, with an epic portfolio of mm. music videos, commercials, short films, and more. He started his unofficial official production company, Yeah Films, back in grade nine as a label for the skate videos that he and his best friends were doing. And when the skateboarding stopped being cool, <laughs> And uh, they opened it up and started writing storylines where they'd film parties, shenanigans at school, and mock talk shows. After high school, it became Miguel's freelance operation with a focus on pop, pop punk music videos where he's taken to great heights. With some absolutely stunning, inspired, edgy work with bands such as Knuckle Puck, Mayday Parade, and Seaway, uh, Miguel fashions himself more of an artist than all business. And as he so eloquently put it, He'd rather be the Andy Warhol than the Elon Musk, and I think, especially after Saturday Night Live, I think we can all aspire to that. Yet he is constantly grinding out project after project, keeps up a heck of a momentum, so he's found the balance. Yeah, we're looking forward to bringing Miguel on to talk about his journey as a filmmaker, uh, the freelance hustle, his passion for directing, best practices with clients, and a few common connections to the Brotherhood. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's bring Miguel into the live. And here we go. Hey! Hello. How's it going, guys? That that was that was hilarious. We don't even need to we don't even need to talk further after that introduction. Come on. Oh, there you go. What's going on? So that was golden. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. We're good. Yeah, man. What's new with you? Uh, nothing much. Is this the best way? Nothing. Is this the what I go? Is this the best way to do it like this? Yeah, yeah. We ah, okay. We don't tell people what to do. You can do whatever you want. You can go okay, side, cool, side cool. down. Um, well, uh, nothing's new because of, you know, pandemic related stuff. So just post-production mayhem here and uh, a lot of remote music video shooting. So it's funny, like we're having this conversation because I think things have changed a lot in the last year and I still haven't come to a conclusion with how much has changed. Like we're still in the middle of it, you know, there's no end point, like right. things haven't come back fully yet. So I'm, I'm stoked on this talk to see like what, how you guys feel, what you guys are up to, and and yeah, yeah, I'm stoked. Yeah, I mean it's it's heavy, but it's a lot of development. Hope, hope for the future. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and like even what's that behind you? What are you doing there? Are those blank cards? You flip those around? What's going on there? So this is just a it's a, just a decoration. <laughs> cool, cool. I love it. Uh, to fill these cards uh, with something. We've already kind of, we already filled the board with a thing called Portals, uh, which I'm currently writing with Nick uh, as sort of like a 10 to 15 minute, six episode, uh, interactive drum. Oh, cool, cool. And is that getting made? Or yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm in the process right now of writing the screenplays for each episode and then um, I'm also in the process of trying to, you know, put together like a package and also, you know, just like looking for applications for funding and trying to figure out what the best way to move forward with it, but also just trying to finish it so that we can shoot it if we don't get funded. Yeah, I hear you. 
absolutely. And that's like, that's always the challenge is like trying to make it in a way where you can make it either way, you know, with, with or without the funding. And I, I totally get that, especially with music videos. A lot of the times we try and get the funding and they're like, if it doesn't happen, then we'll, you know, we'll still make the video. But um, forward. yeah, that's a tricky what, place to play in. What's it like out in Vancouver uh, for you? Um, like lifestyle wise or work like, uh, cause it's, it's, it's weird, man. Yeah. Um, it's a lot yeah. different than Toronto and because it's been a pandemic, like I've seen it from like a very narrow view, like just the beach and stuff. I live in Kitsilano. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, that's been like my experience literally for like the last year is like chilling by the beach by it's like Trinity Bellwoods, but with the ocean, it's exactly what it's like. Um, right. if you guys have been there in Toronto and, um, yeah, like it, it's, uh, definitely like no complaints as far as like, I can't complain about our experience with COVID because our province is like smaller than Ontario and it's different. Um, like the way it's governed and stuff. And, um, so like COVID wise, like I can't, like, I'm glad I'm in Vancouver and, but I'm still navigating like the filmmaking community here. And it's definitely like a lot different than people say it is. And I think a lot of people are like, it's it, filmmaking's booming out in Vancouver. Like come out here. But like, I really think, the independent community is like really thriving in Toronto and like here it's like big productions and like bigger scale stuff. And like definitely you can get experience on those sets and get jobs on them and help out and assist and stuff. But um, I think like in Toronto as an independent artist, it's like way better so far in my experience, but pandemic started like four months, five months after I moved here. So it was just like, I got wrecked. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what uh, affected the pandemic life? Um, yeah, I mean, like, I went from, like, shooting lots of music videos in America, like, you know, at least once a month going down there to, like, not being able to go there. And it's still, like, you can't, like, you can go there, but with the quarantines and stuff on either end, um, it just, it's never, like, logical to do that. So all my shoots have been remote. And, like, I, like, creative directed a shoot last Friday remote, and then I have another one this Saturday remote. Um, and, like, maybe another one on Sunday or something. So, um it like that's like been the biggest change is like the fact that like i actually haven't been on set for real since like october um but i've made videos since october lots of videos <laughs> but i've never i haven't been there uh and like it's very weird but it's weird it's like it's like the longest i've gone without going on set and like i miss like working with a cinematographer i miss all that so much that's yeah, weird so you're directing from you're directing remotely um this saturday is like the first time i'm like like gonna be able to be hands on. Um, it's all green screen, so it's not like too intensive, but I'm gonna have like a link to the camera on Zoom, so I'll see the shot and stuff. And it's not too crazy with the direction, but most of the videos I've built them in a way where someone like the cinematographer can direct it or an assistant director can take it over. Um, and like, that's why like, for example, I did that like animated video that just came out because like it's all band performance on animation that I can just work remotely with an animator. And like the, the concepts are matching that. It's not like I'm trying to do, I will do what we usually do like um, sometimes, but I'm like trying to like make the videos match a remote feel. Um, so it's not like live direction, like me talking on the mic to somebody. I haven't done that fully yet, um, but there's definitely lots of pre-production. Sounds pretty cool. Um, how's, so how's the freelance remote hustle then? How does that work? We're talking, there was a freelance hustle before COVID. What's, how's Change. yeah i mean um luckily like i i did do a lot of cold emailing you know in the beginning of covid and like making people know like i'm still working like i can still work on stuff and like people are like oh like are you still shooting up there i'm like yeah like you want me to shoot i'll shoot like uh it's just parred down it's always been within the guidelines um so but thankfully i haven't like had to like do too much cold emailing and stuff like freelance networking it's just working with the usual clients I work with and the, the music um, side of things, like not a lot of artists are making music videos right now. They are happening for sure, but it feels like everyone's waiting um, till like they can start their next cycles on tour. Cause like when you release a music video, like uh, it has to like advertise some, something or be a funnel for like a sale. And like without the tour, it like really gets lost. Um, but there is music videos being shot. It's just like, I, I, I'm doing, a bunch, but it's not like it's usually like, it's not like it was before COVID, you know, like bumping. Um, but there's been lots of editing and stuff. So lots of editing, like um, stock footage for ad agencies. This is and often like, editing that you're doing. 
Pardon, sir? This would be offline creative editing. That exactly, yeah. Like a lot of stuff just for social media. Um, and, and like, it's like, you know, editing eight different pieces of content that are like different in slightly different ways. Cause like Facebook has a thing where like you can run like 10 ads and then choose the best one, you know, and prioritize them. I'm sure you've experienced that with, with what you're trying to do. And um, so I have to like make like tons of variations. So I've been doing like a lot of editing and digging into that and, and I'm thankful for it. Like it's all good. And um, I love editing and uh, it's just part of like what's happening with the pandemic. Like I, I thinking about networking and stuff, it's like, um, I, I feel like, I don't know what the tone of the scene is right now. Like, I don't want to be that guy reaching out to people like during a pandemic, you know, trying to get work. Cause it's like, yo, like line up buddy. And like, so I'm like focusing on the personal relationships, I guess, you know, not so much networking. And I, I'm, I'm privileged to be able to say that. Like I have like consistent, you know, callback people and referrals and stuff. So it's been good, but it's a mystery how I landed here, you know, Jane, like, <laughs> like it wasn't this consistent, like when we met and like, I didn't really change my approach since we met, you know, it's just been the usual, like just in the trenches and stuff. And same with you, like you work at Rolling Pictures now, right? Like, and did you really like, what, is there like a secret to how you snagged that? Yeah. You did? Oh, there yeah. is. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, I, I got, uh, I had an internal reference. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you go. See? But that's like intangible. If you were supposed to give someone advice, like how to get a job there, you'd be like, know somebody. Like, you know, it's so intangible. It's like a mystery. They, uh, it was funny. I mean, like they, I think they, you'd like, I don't know how many, maybe a hundred people, but like, like we're with for the role. Oh, like, really? I, yeah. So I come in, cause it's like, you know, you're answering the phone, like it's everything. Um, and so sure. and you're the face, you're the first person people come in contact with. Um, and so I go into the interview, the first interview with uh, Joe and Augusta, and uh, the interview goes great. Like I'm laughing the entire time. Like I don't even, it didn't feel like an interview, just so much, like just three people talking and laughing. Um, and then they, I'm like, but I also have an internal reference. My uh, really good friend, Hari Ramesh, who's from, the, who I know from Sault Ste. Marie up north. Cool. Uh, got a job working in the Sioux remotely as like he was doing data systems analyst. He's now an online editor, but anyway, at the so time they're like, okay, well, we'll FaceTime with him. And so they FaceTime him, they show, show him. And he knows I'm going in for the interview. And they, they're just like, hiring Jane would be the worst mistake you ever make. So they <laughs> <laughs> that, that one, is that what like sealed the deal for you? <laughs> but I had a second interview. Again, it wasn't second. really an interview. I was hanging out with two other guys that worked at the company. And then cool. two months passed working there and then COVID. So it's been like a year and four months working there of like, you know, like I don't know. It's been a weird, it's been an interesting gig and it, it changes still all the time. Like I'm getting back now. Um, I want to learn more about the business, but like I'm always sort of like my, I don't know, my eyes open, my ears open to what everybody is learning, working on, trying to you know, yeah. up, update my language with how the post-production workflows go, but also just understanding how the business operates. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the real part for sure. And like, that's the stuff you can take with you, like on your own endeavors. Like that, there's a lot of learning there for absolutely. sure. And then uh, I, I have the, the social media job at Buck. Burglar and doing job at Buck. And that's free. Uh, I've been doing this wildfire more than a year. Like, yeah, when's this movie coming out? That's a great question. We're, we're, that is the million dollar question. We're refining uh, the trailer as we speak. Uh, oh, cool. Trying to release that to really uh, sell it because, as we know, you know, the trailer will sell the film more than the film will sell the film. Yeah, the certain... trailer. Yeah, will get more views than the movie. Uh, does. It'll... <laughs> yeah, it'll, and it'll yeah, it'll get more views. It'll be more, feel more interest. Try and sell it, but uh, we're at the point where we have uh, great. He's the director, visual effects uh, artist, as well as editor. So he's been yeah. kind of just overloaded, um, but he likes it. enjoying the process. And he, kn he knows this film inside and out. So um, yeah, let's get to you, Miguel. You're sure, sure. I'll admit you. I admit you are cutting out just a little bit. I switched it to LT before, but I'll keep it on Wi-Fi. I swear. Hmm. But um, 
If I might need you to repeat some things sometimes. But I, you can hear me. Can you hear me clearly? Oh, well then, like if you just yeah. Talk slow. I, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm reading lips though, as an editor does. Yo, we're both we're all drinking. This is great. Cheers, man. Cheers. I got a Budweiser. <laughs> Go. Um, well, let's, let's go. Uh, let's go back to how you briefly. But yeah, I, uh, I, it was, uh, I mean, I could just say it just, I got hired on Brotherhood. Yeah. Um, immediately became Richard Bell, the director's assistant. He was like, our lead, Jake Manley in the film, has uh, best friends uh, it, with this guy, Miguel. Reach out to Miguel. He's going to be our BTS guy. And yeah. I was like, yo. And then, I, was it, where did we, like, I can't remember whether we met in Toronto or if it was in Ottawa. Oh, I think it was in, like, it was up there, like, because I didn't, I met up with the shoot late because I, I got hired late. Like, I think, I don't know, BTS was kind of overlooked. And then somebody was like, we need fucking BTS. And then Jake, you know, you recommended me, you reached out. And then I, like, flew up there solo, I think. Like, it was already happening, um, which is which is crazy. I can't believe I got on that plane. And then, because <laughs> I hate flying so much. And then, um, yeah, I met up with you guys. And uh, yeah, it was a whirlwind, man. It was really cool to be out there. And then it was the end of the summer. It was like September, right? Kind of kind of chilly. Um, but it was like perfect weather the whole time. And when it was meant to be rain rainy in the movie, it was like rainy for real. I don't know if they like scheduled that. Do you know if they scheduled it on purpose? Like the day... When the canoe capsizes, we're just doing spoilers here. Capsizes, um, it, it rains. It rained on that day, but that was the only day it rained, kind of, right? Like, the, uh, I mean, I just, I was the assistant to the director for the prep, and I didn't really stop during the production, but then during production, I to the fourth AD, so I was assistant yeah. director. And during that period, I was working uh, with the first AD, Paco, uh, yeah. who was dealing with the elements just so much so as the actual fighting the challenge of making a feature film on a minimal amount of time and you know and resources were all over the place so it was like the elements had a huge impact on our schedule they delayed us they made it difficult but they also created this thing about like you have less time so you have to get it quicker and the magic you have to get it quicker so i don't know i yep. feel like elements have a weird way of i don't know creating magic sometimes in that sometimes waiting on set it just like everything gets like harnessed inside. And then when the time comes that you actually have to do it, it's like, there's like the energies there. Yeah. It's interesting. Like it, it, I feel like watching the movie and, and thinking like, you know, as a director as well, it'd be interesting to like have those time constraints when like it really works for the scene and then other times have the freedom, you know, but I guess it's hard to gauge like when you should be rushing or not, but it definitely had all that intensity because of that. And, but I do think what a blessing was like how many days there were in the tank. Like the tank didn't feel rushed, so to no. speak. It felt really chill, maybe because of the safety factor. Um, couldn't really rush because someone would drown. Um, but that was like intense. And that wasn't the tank like almost equal amount of days as like dry land. It like, was, I think it was eight and eight or like eight and nine. Yeah. Or yeah. Or something. Um, yeah. And, and it's weird because the tank actually. Yeah, I wonder what how because he structured it non-linearly. I wonder how much of the movie's in the tank and how much of the movie's like the flashbacks and stuff. Yeah, I wonder if it's fifty-fifty. I mean, there's a lot in that last day too. Yeah, day. yeah, yeah. There's so many scenes. Yeah, that shit's beautiful. That's like that's like Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe. Like you just like you just drop into the period. It did, it did a really good job of dropping you into the period. Um, I wanted to just shout out to Andrew and Jonathan Bronfman. Uh, Yes. On the, the film, I have worked a bit more with Andrew in in the past few months, and he's oh really? Awesome. That's cool. Um, but what happened was Kelly, uh, the associate producer on the film, yes. all the hotels, and Miguel and I had uh, oh yeah rooms in like this nice like sort of super uh, Polish uh, hotel where we got to uh, eat some really good Polish food. Um, but then but we got the mansion. We got the producer's mansion. We got booted out, and they were like, you're going to have to go stay on Paco's couch. And I was like, oh. And then Kelly's like, oh, wait, the Brockmans, they're leaving. You can take their mansion. And yeah, so yeah. We don't have any booze. We don't have any weed. We get there. They hook us up. They're, like, driving us around. It was quite treated like kings. We're our kings. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, we were kings. But that was like only one or two nights, right? That was really quick. I think it was like three nights. I, I would say like it was like three good about. nights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's dope. Yeah, it it was a fun shoot. And that's that's the shoot where I had 15 hard-boiled eggs from Craft Services. Oh, God. Um, we were set legends. I like how like it was like <laughs> it being on a set is super serious. But I think we near the end of it, we all kind of like broed out and like find ways to like you know toe that line between like fucking around and actually shooting <laughs> hopefully nobody's watching it from this but but like we were having a good time you know it was fun it, it was, was fun yeah we had fun off uh offset as well went, went out a few times and uh, yeah had, had good times with all the actors and the actors and, and the crew like uh, and it wasn't like sort of like it was everybody was on the same platter having a good time with one another no exactly. hierarchy, hierarchy offset and then uh just shout out Mike and Evan and Spencer. I saw them when the Raptors won the championship. Oh, sick. House. <laughs> yeah. Embraced. Brothers embraced. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, brotherhood in general, man. Like it was, uh, I feel like I have some like stress and PTSD caused from it because it was a pretty insane experience for me. Yes. From, for me. But I, I, I definitely one of the best learning experiences I've had ever. Like just. Yeah, it was, it was cool to see like that kind of shoe at that kind of level. Um, and and you know, to its credit, it is like a period movie, and it's there's so much at play that's like really expensive, um, like the the wardrobe and like the huge ensemble cast. Like he did, uh, Richard didn't make it easy on himself. You know what I mean? He he wrote that with like an ensemble cast, and of like I think all those guys are gonna like make it in their own ways, you know, and find their footing in different like genres. But um, yeah, yeah, it was it. I can't like it's sick. It got made. You know, it was just such a challenge. And, like, that kind of thing doesn't happen often, especially in this day and age. Well, it's been 16, everybody's stock rise. Um, yeah. Obviously, uh, Jake's been doing great, and Evan's been doing really well, too, and see Brendan Fair all the time, too. And, I mean, everybody, every single, me you know, every member of the Brotherhood. What about what about Fletcher, eh? Fletcher's such a legend. And, like, I moved here, and, like, we're, I want to hang out with him. I want to go out for a drink with him, but, like, the world changed, and I can't, like, see him. And he, su like, has such great energy. The guys, like, I want to, I feel like everybody wants to go out to be Brendan Fletcher. I mean, <laughs> Freddie versus Jason, and sometimes I feel like Brendan Fletcher's going to my fucking nightmare. Well, that's the thing. It's like, I don't, <laughs> I, I've, I don't see a lick of, like, those kind of characters in his actual personality, the way he chills and stuff. Like, he's so chill. Like, if, I feel like he's a kind of, if you be too excited about something, he might be like, yo, chill out. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's that cool. Um so when I see those characters where he's like playing like a real madman and stuff, I'm just like, like that comes from a place like I don't usually see. Like I don't know where he gets that from. Um, and he's like not done his journey either, you know. Like all these guys are gonna like I can't wait to see where they go. Is... <laughs> well, yeah, I remember hearing all these stories before. Yeah. Board, man, Yo, you, I gotta shout out you for just being <laughs> the important person. In that. <laughs> shout out to what? Sorry, you're cut, you're cut. To, you, huh? to you, to you, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or through the process, it was, it, it was a lot, like it was definitely a lot, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, you know, it's it's not like we all didn't want to be there in the end, so no, it's all. just a battle of a film. And like, any like one day, you know, you're gonna be the Richard Bell in, in the situation. And, you're gonna have people like us on the come up and um, it's just like a cycle. You know, everyone goes through it. It's just the way it is. Like you pay your dues and yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, getting back to you and sort of like what your visual style that you've kind of crafted over the years, uh, what are some inspirations uh, visually that have come to you? Like favorite director, some of your favorite films? Uh, yeah, what, what stuff influences and inspires you? Yeah, I mean, because like over the last couple of years, definitely like falling into like a mode where um, I want, like I'm trying to do things lean and fast and, you know, with lower crew and stuff. So like my taste, like I love like, you know, big budget filmmaking and like high level look and I want to do stuff with crazy camera moves, et cetera. But unfortunately the money doesn't allow for that. So strategically, like I've chosen to take like a more, like um contempt like classic contemporary approach like i think like for stanley kubrick you know he didn't have like a techno crane and and he just got the steady cam you know like later in his career um so i'm like 
Uh, so in my thinking is like, if he had a tribe, like I have all the stuff Kubrick had like for 2001 Space Odyssey, as far as like making that camera, like move and stuff, just on a tripod, simple. And it was so heavy that you can't go handheld and stuff. And like, if you look at my work, that's kind of been like my approach to the camera uh, technique is like, keep things locked off and simple and only go handheld like when you have to, you know, and if it has a purpose. And that is like not even, that's not so much stylistically informed as much as it is like, like a business side, like, you know, what's the best production value I can do for the money. And like, in my opinion, it's like a challenge. Like if I can make a tripod shot, like look dynamic, like locked off, then like, you know, once I can go dynamic, it'll be much easier. Um, and then to, to the point of the, the lighting, like I love Robert Richardson. Um, he does like Quentin Tarantino's uh, cinematography. Um, and like, basically like the Robert Richardson things like hot light from above, like he loves like, you know, using a hot light over a table that reflects back onto the people and like tons of diffusion and like edge light too around their face. Um, and like that, anytime I can do lighting under the budget, like that's evident in the work is like, he's one of my main inspirations um, because like it has a lot of style and like um, range and like the shadows to the bright. Like I want lots of like dynamic contrast, I guess you could say. So Robert Richardson's like a really sick example of that. And it's cheap. Like, for example, like, um, what's the movie? The Hateful Eight? Was that? Yeah, like, um, they use like par cans, like from the top, you know, from the ceiling, just like blasting hot light down. And like, if you think about it, like, you know, it's cheaper than like a Kino flow. It's cheaper than like a bunch of stuff. And like, it's really easy to emulate. Um, so those are like my biggest inspirations, like Kubrick, Robert Richardson, um, like uh, Spike Jones, of course, uh, for his experimental filmmaking. And then, yeah, like it, it kind of branches out from there. And then in the end, like I do work with like tons of different artists and people with their own tastes and stuff. So I try and bounce and like go from there. Um, uh, someone asked like, the, uh, red or black magic. Um, like, yeah, I mean, I started with black magic back in the day, but then in the end I like red. Um, Never used, I've used an Alexa once and um, haven't used it since. I don't know why I'm a red fanboy. I think it just goes back to like my youth. Like the Alexa didn't exist when I was, you know, younger. And re I think the re red preceded that maybe. I could be wrong, but um, I was stoked from like the red one and on. And I've used them over the years and I love those cameras. Black Magic, obviously like making huge strides, but I'm like, I'm not at a point where like, like I know that like changing my camera at this point is not going to change the whole video. Like, um, it's about the lenses in the end. Um, that'll, like, make the biggest difference, I think, in how the video looks. So I'll just go with any kind of red camera. <laughs> I'll take any of those. And then, like, after that, I actually prefer Panasonic GH5S um, because that's, like, really light. You can run it all day on two memory cards. Um, and uh, it, like, it's, like, really easy to use, and it's got sick dynamic range. And mainly for, like, the body. It's, like, super light. And uh, it's good enough for music videos, you know, especially at these budget levels. And that's like what I'm learning to stress in like these conversations is like, I'm not like getting like, you know, like 30K, 50K videos, like not even close. So like, it's like, um, there's only so many times I can go like all in on the budget to get like a sick Alexa, you know, like I need to survive. Um, and it's like a double-edged sword because like I can't, I can't keep doing, you know, the same like I can't keep putting all the money into the video, so I have to find ways to make it like under that budget. And that's a, that's the challenge, you know. So that's why, like, when you at, when I hear a question about style, I'm like, damn, like, if if I had like a million dollars, my style would be completely different. Like I'm trying to play like in a tiny sandbox. <laughs> yeah, it's challenging. It really is, especially um, at this. Yeah, it's challenging because like. There, I can point tons of videos that I've made and I'm like, I didn't pay myself on that. I didn't pay myself on that. And like now, like I live on my own in Vancouver. Like I live, like I'm so far from home and like no, like no one's going to save me. Right. Like, so I need to pay myself to survive. <laughs> so I can't keep doing that over and over. So it's like, how could I do what I've already done? But like for cheaper, right. But without compromising the vision either. It's a challenge. It's a super um, challenge. Talking about one of Oh, uh, which, which project, sorry? Uh, Jake, because... Agave, uh, Tequiliana. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That one was awesome. 
And uh, I guess we're just curious about some of the stylistic choices. Like, what made you want to go uh, black and white, and what drew you to the subject matter and all that? Because we found it really captivating. Were you inspired by Roma? Uh, yes, yeah, so that was the same year Roma came out, and Roma killed it. And like, I was like black and white for sure, but also, um, like Mexico, like. Uh... Yeah, as much as it is colorful, I think when you get out into the tequila fields on like this super hot day, like it's not, it's striking, but like in black and white, it looks amazing. Yeah. So it's like, you know, as much as it was inspired by Roma, I just kind of like agree with, all, I'm like, it looks better in black and white. I agree. I agree with like his tone. Um, and like, that is like the best example of what I just explained about like how I, if I can make something look dynamic on a tripod, then like I'm all good. Like yeah. there's not a single... Um, moving shot in that video. There's not a single pan or tilt because I couldn't do it on the tripod, I don't think, on this one. And um, they, yeah, not a single handheld shot, uh, not once. <laughs> I, I, I loved your use of sound. I liked yeah. your overall Thank thing. You. Like the cu cutting to the drums using stills, uh, cut to, um, and going into the machinery. I felt like I was in Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times. I was getting like a vibe of like just the way cool. the process worked. Um, what did cool, you Cool, cool you shoot it on uh, to, to your point on the modern like that's what i try to focus on is like making it like archival almost and like timeless and like if you're an alien coming to earth like to think <laughs> about tequila what would it look like right. uh and then um i shot on a sony a6300 yeah yeah i love that camera and uh canon type r sony a7 III. Yeah, that, I would love the Sony A7S II. I would use that any day. I haven't used any new cameras because cause life is just not the same anymore, you know? But you, you would run into these cameras out in the real world all the time working with people. But I haven't seen anybody in person in a long time who's a filmmaker. <laughs> uh, so what cameras are, are you currently rock? Uh, I don't even own a video. I don't own a camera. Um, mm -hmm. My a 300 broke, and yeah, like all my, like I'm – like a director editor so it's a lot of editing work and then um yeah like i don't i don't sh i don't shoot my own music videos like i would i would rent the camera gear and stuff and i prefer to rent and i started on the dvx user forum like 17 years ago and on dvx user there was a guy who was like rent don't buy and like it was this thing and like i kind of agree with him now and i just get to use like the latest stuff specifically for what i'm shooting if i rent um and like it doesn't happen often like i'm not renting the gear myself and shooting the video myself often, especially during the pandemic. Like, so I'm just a director and that's the whole thing. Like, plus you see what, what Richard Bell did as well. And I'm sure you've seen it a lot since like, like the director doesn't fucking shoot. Like he might operate the camera, but he's not lighting and doing all, you have to learn how to communicate that stuff. And like, you have to learn how to verbally explain it. Like if you can't do that, like you can't go to a bigger set, et cetera. So that's why like, I, don't, I don't even need a camera. Like I communicate like for a living and, all I have to do is like tell a cinematographer what I want and work with him and collaborate and, um, or her, sorry. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So I don't even have, I have, um, a 5D Mark II, but the aperture doesn't work on it. Uh, so, I mean, you talked a little bit about communicating the vision. Um, what's it like just for you? Like, what's it been like being a director? Like, specifically, what's, what's that experience been like with the day? Yeah, I mean, day to day, um, thankfully, like I have a ton of editing and like, so that fills a lot of the time, but, um, like I've made like my work fun and my fun, like work kind of in a way. And like, it's just natural. Like I work like seven days a week. Like if I take the day, like if I don't work for a day, it's like, because like I'm doing something that's planned, but like if I'm at home and now I out in the room, like I'm, I'm at the computer, like there's always something to do and work on. And. And it's not like an obsession or a workaholic. It's just like, this is what I like to do. It's fun. Um, I thankfully found, like I found this when I was a lot younger, when I was like 15, I didn't fall into it. And I didn't like do something else and choose this. Like this was like when I was like literally 14 or 15, this was like what I wanted to do and started doing it. So this is like fun. And like, I'm very grateful for like all the opportunities. And, and uh, so yeah, like, it's not like there's a routine. It's just, like, wake up at 5 a.m. Pacific because, like, everything right now is in Eastern. And then work – I'm going to work after this, too. And um, just, like, I don't have, like, a to-do list or anything. It's just, like, whatever I'm doing, like, it's all, like, a river. It's, like, what am I going to work on right now? And it's, like, 
I, I'm good at email, so I can keep up. You know, Jay, like if you're good at email, you can do half this battle. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so spelling your like I spelled your name right, and then I spelled it wrong in the subject heading. It's I all want good. To myself, I fucking hate that. That's all good. It. Yeah. Oh my god, Nick like called me out. I did I did a live stream graphic for the wrong date. Like, go is don't get overloaded at the same time. Like you want to do so many things, but it's like yes, don't get overloaded. Yeah, yeah, and like that's what I'm trying to like work on right now. And um, like I guess being a director, it's like different for everybody, and that's like the point. Like, like it's it's not a lifestyle. It's just like you, you kind of like live your work, and you're always like curious about you know, something relevant to your work or something that interests you like out in the real world. Like we're just all, you know, like we're just perpetual researchers, perpetual communicators. And it's a very like fluid job and it's different for everybody. You know, it's, I like met up with a director yesterday and he's like totally different than me and has like a different like point of view and different priorities and stuff. And um, it's like, an, a, a, it's an ever changing thing. And I think like if you find your own way of being a director or like in life and your work, that's like key. Like your life will inform the work. Like don't try and like live someone else's life or think directing has to be something. Like don't let another director tell you like, this is the way I do it or the way I live this way you should do it. Like do whatever works for you. Cause it's like such a weird intangible thing. And we've, we've, we've seen it like all kinds of, we hear it in Hollywood all the time. Like um, directors all work dif in different ways. Like it's all, you know, it, there's not like one straight way to be a director, I guess. And like, that's something I let go of like a long time ago. Like, um, you know, at a certain point you have to stop like reading about it and like just work, you know, like definitely research, but you know, I'm not like, if I have like an action scene, I'm not Googling, like how do how does he shoot an action scene, you know, beyond technical, like I want to figure out my own way of doing it. So, yeah. I'm reading a new earth and finding your inner calling by Eckhart Tolle, which is, just, you know, sick, getting rid of the ego. And just like every yes. time you, you know, you're trying to do something and it's like, oh, but they do it that way. That's where you go. Let's go. Like, do, you do it the way you, you want to do it. Or if you're like thinking like that person is, you know, the way I'm like, I'm better than that. It's like, don't, don't let that be your ego. No. I, yeah. Like let, let like everything, just let everything be and then find mm -hmm. POV and, you know, and, and, find what makes your voice different and, and that's your directing voice. I guess that's your, that's your vision. That's your, uh, your authenticity, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the ego is a big part of it because like you're working in a team situation. And then the, I think like for young people and like for me halfway through growing up, like the lure of like being a jack of all trades, like an influencer and like doing everything on Instagram, you know, like doing it, like editing, directing, shooting, doing everything. Like I, it, like people kick ass at it, but like if you want to work at a bigger scale, you need to, you know, learn how to communicate. Um, so like the ego is like definitely a barrier to like that. And like, because like you need to know your ego to like deal with other people's egos and you need to know like how ego works and um, especially with like musicians and stuff. And like, like I like, I don't run into like problem. Like uh, I love like working with musicians cause like I understand them and I understand what they want and like, I understand how to like make their ego work in my favor. So it's pretty sick. Um, <laughs> and like not having ego is so key. Like the people I work with, um, we're like always just helping each other and like giving support and feedback and stuff. And uh, like Benjamin Lieber is like a creative director. I work with a ton. And um, it, it, like we made, we ha I always talk about this, but like we had a discussion about ego like before we first started working. We we're like, we're, we're going to like work towards like a bigger thing together. And like, the jack of all trades thing is just like, it's like a dead end. I feel like, unless you want to do that, like if you want to do that, like that's fine. But like I want to work on the big sets and stuff. And like, you can't, there's no like, you know, being an asshole. I don't want to be an asshole. And like, you know, to like get what I need. And like, I understand it works for some people, but like there's other ways to do that. Um, I keep bringing up Kubrick a lot. Cause like I've been reading about him a lot lately and I'm going to rewatch his movies, but like for like, not that I'm saying his process wasn't valid. Like, torturing people but um it's just like that was his process so like i can't like come across i can't land on that just because he did it it has to be natural like when kubrick was being a dick to, dick to people he wasn't like following like um a lesson or another director that's just like him i was just him he was just an asshole so i'm not gonna like act like an asshole you know 
That's not me. <laughs> you don't need to act like Kubrick, but exactly. To, yeah, but you want to find something to get to that sort of intensity. Intensity he creates. Um, There's other ways. There's other ways. You don't have to torture people. <laughs> um, so what what made you want to get involved in the pop punks? Were you already involved before you started? Yeah, I mean, um, the, I kind of that's one thing I fell into is like. Seaway is like one of the main bands I work with. I've made most of the music videos and they went to my high school. Like we're all the same friend group and like our friend group preceded, you know, the band and even like I was making videos, but like not music videos. They were like my first legit music video. And um, through them, like they got signed by a label they're still with in California. And then I started working tons with them and I went on tour with them. And uh, like I started working with the label a lot on their bands. And I went on tour with Seaway, and then I started working with Knuckle Puck on like some of my favorite videos we've ever made, and like our most played videos, a Knuckle Puck video. And uh, so that's like a who you know thing. And like I, you know, we grew like they did a couple videos on their own, like with someone else, and then they did a few with me. Um, so like I got to build upon like what I did with Seaway with them. It didn't like happen at the same time; they were like kind of after each other. Um, and then from there, it's like Knuckle Puck has always been like a super artistic, like thoughtful band with their creative direction and like the lyrics and the instrumentation and stuff. So a lot of people, they were like, the ne they're the next thing, you know? And like, I'm pretty sure, I, I, they, I think they're evolved in like, into like a mainstay now. They're not the next thing anymore. Um, but like, uh, it helped me like get other jobs in the genre, like other gigs, because like people looked, like they were like, the, the yeah the Quentin Tarantino of like pop punk you know people wanted the next knuckle puck thing and like there was a lot of pressure to like make a sick video and stuff and like they have tons of plays and eyeballs and they're huge and it's sick <laughs> so like uh it, it came from there and now it's like all pop punk and like I'll be honest like I don't even listen to pop punk um <laughs> I listen to like alt rock I listen to dream pop um symphony music shoegaze and uh like classic rock Pop punk, like I literally, there's only a couple classics I listen to, but like I don't, I, I can't, like, it's like very raw sometimes, and like I like some synth and some artifice, and then the lyrics, some, I don't relate to them often. <laughs> uh, when did you first meet Jake Manley? What was that first meeting like, and how did that develop into a friendship and dare I brotherhood? <laughs> a brotherhood. <laughs> yeah, Jake, um, I met him in high school, like in grade nine. Um, and uh, I guess, like, like, it's not like, you know, when you meet people, sometimes it's not by chance. Like, I think it's more by chance that, like, I lived in Oakville, you know? But, like, he was a skater. Um, he was a skater boy. And, like, we were part of a huge skater crew. So, like, all the skaters, like, grouped together at our school. Like, there wasn't, like, five skaters here and then, like, another skate crew. Like, we, like, were our rival. Like, our skate crew was, like, 15 people and, like, we were all, we all grouped together. So like, if you pick skateboarding, we, you would have been in our group, you know, you would have been our friend, we were skating. And um, so I met him in grade nine. And then from there, like, he was always like interested in programs and stuff. Cause he's the one who gave me my first editing program. Like he pirated, he pirated Avid for me. And like, I never learned Avid cause Avid was hell. So we went from Avid to like Final Cut Pro 7, which we pirated too. And like, I guess it came from like filming skateboarding. And he just, I think maybe, so basically Christoph Benfi shoots like Seaway videos for me. See Benfi, he's really active, um, a really active creator. And uh, he like had a skate crew. He's older than us. And he made skate videos and stuff with like a guy named Phil McKnight. I'm going off here, but whoever's listening, this is like Ontario lore. But like if you Google Phil McKnight, like skateboarder, like he's literally like what was like one of the best skaters in North America, like going to be at one point, he chose to go down a different path, but he was like a legend and Christoph and him made skate videos. And so Jake knew how to edit like through them. I'm pretty sure like knew how to make. So then Jake gave me the editing program, you know, and then like years went by and we explored filmmaking and now Christoph shoots like my music videos, which are <laughs> our music videos, but it's cool how like fate just kind of like intertwined that way. Um, because I don't, I'm still editing to this day. And like, I don't know if I would have discovered it at early or later. Or, so that, that I'm like so blessed to meet him. And, um, it's you always know, been like from a good, from a good, honest place. Like, uh, I, last thing is just like through Instagram yeah. and social media and stuff. I just think like, 
people like think acting is like a quick route like to money and success and attention and stuff and um jake and his heart's always been in the right place and like same i hope so same with me as a director and um that's why like i just stress in the end like we started like so young so like when jake's on set now like on the order like that's something he's been doing since he was like 15 you know but not in like a hollywood capacity like with his friends <clears throat> so it's like really pure and like it's sick you know it, I, I love it that we're still doing the same stuff we've always been doing well you were shooting a chris but um jake uh was in a film uh with bella, Thor bella thorne yes uh, we at rolling pictures handled a film with bella thorne as well called girl that was yes. shot by for Bunnell, you know Christopher Bunnell? Yeah, yeah. So Chris, he's married to like um, somebody I went to high school with. Um, so I haven't met him in person, but like yeah. we're aware I of each other. Do him in person, and he's like, "Oh yeah, Miguel." And I was just like, "Nice, sick." How, he, wait, how did he know you knew me? Because I was just like, I, I don't know. I just started talking about like brotherhood or something. <laughs> On the film. And uh, he was in for a color session on Girl. And, uh, yeah. That's but, sick. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't. Uh, yeah, I haven't met him in person. Um, but he's a sick cinematographer. And yeah, you work with Mickey Rourke. Like I would kill to have a fucking dart with Mickey Rourke. Um, yeah, this industry is tiny. And Turning out my brightness. That would be I, amazing. Oh my god! Yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah. That yeah. Would... yeah. <laughs> um. What are some things as a director yourself that you look for in other producers, cinematographers, and editors? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's like, it's been like, yeah, it's a good question. It, I have like a wish list of people I want to work with for like lots of different reasons. And like a lot of it's regional. Like um, I have like people for like New York, Chicago, LA, uh, Europe, and like a bit in South America. So it like depends like where I'm gonna shoot and like there are people for like, they're like the rainy day list, you know? When someone's like, we wanna shoot a video here. I'm like, yeah, I got it, um, all good. Like the shoot we're doing this Saturday is like in Columbus, Ohio, which is like random as hell. But like the filmmakers I work with are amazing. Um, and like, so what I look for, like it just depends on the role, like producers. Um, I already have like a producer I wanna work with, like if, if the budget's right already. and just somebody who's like a great communicator and like can really deal with email and stuff. Um, Cause like lots of people want to be like, I want to be a producer and like can't do fucking email. <laughs> and uh, so um, I look for like someone who's like really like detail oriented kind of like on all sides. Um, but cinematographer wise, like I'm really flexible and it depends on the project. Um, and like, I love recommendations. It's not so much looking up stuff I like. It's just like talking to people and like finding recos. But like I have a lot of the team built out already and like the wish list there. So a lot of the times it's not like I'm like searching. Like like I search all the time, like as I'm looking on Instagram, but when a gig comes along, I'm like, oh, I know the person to use for that. Boom. Cause like, for example, like one music video I'm shooting like in the next week or so, like we get the offer like the first week of May and it's due by June 1st. And it's like, I, I need to like get this project together yesterday. Like it's ridiculous. And um uh, I don't have like a lot of time to like do, do soul searching when a project comes up. Um, but like, yeah, it comes, I don't have like a lot of good answers for like the style and flavor part because like I'm very flexible, you know, like there are things I am like non-negotiable about, like, like most of them just fundamental standards, like good exposure, like not like shitty exposure and, you know, like crappy, like crappy gray, et cetera. Like, you know, stuff out of focus, like obvious, but like, I'm super like flexible with who I work with. Like I'm down to try anything and work with anybody. And I honestly don't want to have a style. Um, and like, that's something I've, it's been a reckoning and I've been like dealing with that. Like as far as like what I want to do with my career. Cause like, I don't, I don't want to have an Instagram where you go and you scroll and like, I'm just mentioning Instagram cause that's like the portal, but like, um, we're well, like, it's all, it's all the same like trend. Like it's all the same style and aesthetic. Like that's just not me. And I don't like, it's just not chal like the challenge is just like creating endlessly sick stuff that's like sick for their own merits. Like it's not sick because like it checks my boxes of like my aesthetic. It's sick just on its own. And it's definitely like more challenging that way, you know? I, I think like um it would just get really stale quickly trying to make like the same look, the same thing every time. And it just doesn't that's not how I think. Like there's definitely, you know, things I stay away from, but I'm like open to anything. And like if that, 
if you looked at my work in the last year, that's been evident of it. Like it's all been different and uh, nothing's been the same. And yeah, I'm really down to try anything. I guess like the style is like a working style and like just being a great, a good communicator and being flexible with people. Um, but I'm not harping on people with an aesthetic. Like it definitely has value. It's just like, if I'm going to do this like a hundred more times, if I'm going to make a hundred more music videos, it's like, I can't do it at the same time every time. Jesus, it's going to get ridiculous. And it's not like good business. I feel like you're holding yourself back. Like it, it feels like it's um, instant gratification. Like say something's in for the moment, they're going to get you for it. And then like, you're going to do the same thing for 10 years. Like Jesus, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. Are, are there any things that have happened in your career to all and have to navigate the court? Ways you've had to adapt over the years? Uh, sorry, you, you cut on the middle there, but like hit a wall, like a creative wall? Um, yeah, or anything that made you have to adapt or maybe compromise something uh, in your thought? Yeah, I mean, like without giving too much details, because like I don't want to do that, but like, um, one video shoot like we arrived you know uh, in the like in los angeles to film and basically when push came to shove the artist didn't want to shoot anymore and we're like we're down i'm down there with the cinematographer we have like permits to shoot like it's all legit even though it's low key like i i like if i'm gonna fly to california like we we can be gorilla but like the chance of being kicked out or shut down has to be like super low but for this video it needed to be like legit like we couldn't get kicked out there's like a band playing and stuff so um we they like the artist bailed and then like the shoots like the next day so the the label the same record label was like oh we have another artist who wants to shoot like do you want to make this video and i'm like yeah like sure yeah like we're down here we have all the equipment that we want to shoot you know and we made we like planned a whole shoot with like just a guy and a girl and stuff and a couple other props and, and, and like a vehicle um and uh, we shot the, the next day and like the video is like my like it's in the top 10 most played vids and I had like a day notice on it, like literally a day. And it's like one of those things where like, I can't talk about it because like I work with the label and like I had a good experience. It's all good. Like I'm thankful we worked with this artist, but it's just funny that like, um, like one of my favorite videos ends up being one where like we spend very little time in pre-production on, you know? And it's like, that's an example of like sticking to an aesthetic um, and, and like really having a style you want to like stick to and there's no negotiation behind it. Like I would have been screwed then. It would have been like, I'm fucked. Um, so that's like, have to be super adaptable and like lean. And, and it's not honestly not so much a check, like it's a challenge, but the most challenging thing is like getting the availability for the cinematographer and like having a few like location assets, like that takes the most time. But if you told me like I had to shoot a video tomorrow, like I would do it. Cause like the upside is huge. It's like, it's like you, if I say no, I don't have a video and I don't get paid. If I say yes, there's a chance it's going to be like a 5 million play video and I'm going to get paid. Like it's all like, yeah. So that's a music video world. It's like, it's, it's really like crazy in that way. And that's one way of it. And that's one time I've adapted. Um, Trying to think of one more, one more time. Yeah. Like, it's funny because like my shoots, like we always finish like under time and under budget. That's like my joke. Like we never ask for more money and I never go over time. Like it's always like the day we allot is like the day we do. We never go like, we, if we go 18 hours, that's like something we pre-planned and we all are in it together. But it's net, like, I don't even remember last time I did that. And um, so I don't have to like adapt to like time constraints, constraints a lot. Um, but yeah, I guess like with the pandemic, like just working remotely and like dealing with that. And um, like I'm the communication process is like really fluid. And like, this is like a pitch cell, but like I created like a tool with my friend called Playback. And basically like you can create video treatments along with the music. So like the, you can separate the song into blocks with time codes and each time code will play individually in the program. So you like, you can go on set and like, if the first minute of the song is one location, like that's a block where you can play the song back. And that way I can send these playback sheets to like people remotely and they can follow my filming like to the time code exactly. And then the edits, they all fit in there. It's kind of like a scheduler, you know, for a shoot, but it, it separates it into like playable sound blocks. And if you go to playback.rocks, you can see it more like clearly. Um, but uh, that's like, 
so adapting like with the pandemic is like working remotely, but thankfully that it existed before the pandemic. So I just like leverage that more and use that more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. We're, we're launching for real on like June 2nd. So like it, it, it's, it all works, but um, so for example, you can like export, you know, the time codes into like a PDF and um, there's going to be a discord where we're going to do, chats just like this i'm not sure if you guys are on discord um yeah i, I gotta get on it <laughs> uh, but um playback is like it, it's a sick way to communicate because like you're it's 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 basically like a scene maker like making scenes but within a song so like within three minutes you're like this is gonna happen this is gonna happen this is gonna happen and it's like all in chronological order and then mm -hmm. um that way i can communicate like when i send that to like filmmakers in america like like they get what they get what I need because like it's in the list like it's right, right. there to time code um so that's like one way I've adapted just like working remotely but I think like you always have to be like adaptive and malleable as a director and it's just part of the job like being stagnant is like not like and expecting things to go exactly as they should is like not part of like you know and if they do go exactly the way you want them to you should be like questioning what's happening like there's something I'm missing. There's something fishy happening here. And it's not like things are always a disaster. It's just like, it's a, it's a, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like being a pilot. Like, would you like, like a pilot, I feel like is always adapting. Like when you, when you take off in a plane, it's, it, it's, a, it's exact every time, but like, you, he, I'm sure he's feeling it out and like making sure things are going well. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like I'm a pilot all the time. <laughs> um, yeah. Like I'm feeling a pilot. Like, Things are always different, turbulence and shit, and like navigation and like. Da -da. Ah! I want to pull a, a little curveball out here, if that's all right. Um, sure. Robert Robert Peace, I'm just curious about your uh, oh, yeah. friendship with him. Yeah, so I met. Um, I didn't need a, I met his daughter like just through mutual friends. Like I don't even know how that happened. Um, I think she went to like a separate high school that like I filmed at or something. Or I, I don't know how I got to know her. And then her dad was like, um, I guess like a freelance producer at the time or a producer. And yep. I did like some corporate editing for him. I believe we did like a corporate editing project for like uh, the airport being built in Ecuador. I love all these like uh, plane airport uh, <laughs> you know, things. But, and I worked for him and then like we lost touch and stuff. And like um, he does, does he work at Rolling Pictures now as well? So Robert is based in Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, uh, he basically runs the facility in the Sioux. And he's got a, a lot of, like, hands in a lot of different pots, a lot of different piles, a lot of different baskets. But, um, yeah, he's uh, been sort of our direct – he's been our director of community relations in the Sioux. And he's been shooting stuff, too, on the side. And basically uh, taking all of these, like, Sioux College graduates that are, like, editors and cinematographers. And, like, basically they've become his minions and he's taking over the Sioux. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, I know he – he's like he reaches out he reached out to me over the few over the last few years but like i just like i didn't do that type of work so like yeah. um i should have stayed in contact with him but I, i'm so stoked that like he well, this will cause that this he's got cause. his journey yeah but, yeah that, yeah exactly but I'm, I'm stoked like where he's at like i do i have him on instagram um and like yeah it, it's amazing how much is getting done up in the suit it's like crazy and uh yeah, wonderful wonderful yeah this, uh, yeah um we're gonna have this play as sort of the uh, the still that people oh, yeah, see so. uh, at the end so if you feel like smiling or doing any sort of uh <laughs> oh wait yeah. oh well oh, will i be in it you're in it yeah you'll be in it totally. there yeah uh, that's a good screenshot moment just uh yeah i mean we're kind of like right right, right yeah. at our time so i'll we'll give the floor to you is there anybody you want to shout out or uh Tell, anything else you want to tell us about the stories you're passionate about telling? I mean, we're we're looking forward to seeing what's next. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we're, we're stoked that you came on here, man. Thanks. I, I appreciate it. And, like, yeah, I, I feel like I'm scrambled eggs all the time because, like, it's hard to, like, put into words, like, you know, my job, like, for me and the way I do it and stuff. And I, I just, like, I feel like, um, like, a lot of my work and my journey, like, I feel like an underdog and, like, you know, I, I'm doing things, like, with, like, <laughs> Um, low budgets and like um, it's not like I haven't leveled up it's just um, I don't know what it like working in pop punk is difficult you know and, and like low-key alternative rock 
and like life has like taken its course and like before you know it like make making videos like the years go by so i just think it, it's important as a filmmaker to be like aware of your journey and like making choices that like not not benefit you but <clears throat> that are on like the path you want to go i almost feel like i like lean too heavy into like music video like this stuff and i should have been focusing on other things um even like editing for example and like i, I could have gotten like an editing job somewhere you know and the pandemic just makes you realize all these kind of things. And um, yeah, just being like being flexible, but also being like aware of what's happening. Like that's what I think is the most important thing as a director. Like if I was going to say one last thing and um, because like, I don't get to often put what I do into words in these conversations. So like, I'm like ending this call, like fuck, like this is an ex existential crisis, you know? <laughs> we love self-reflection here. We love, uh, yeah. well, and I think it's important, uh, you know, to, understand that maybe we did spend time not doing what we were supposed to at certain points or maybe you know there's certain things that just kind of like push us you know and all over the place but i i don't know man time's weird i mean it's covid too so oh, yeah. i think staying busy and staying like you know focused on tasks uh has been a mainstay for me and and these live streams have been a really nice way for us to get together and have conversations with other people that are going through these same rhythms and motions so exactly. uh, you're about to jump back into an edit um, we're going to talk about how this live stream went. I'm going to message you and say, man, this was awesome. <laughs> and yeah, dude, just, uh, I'll see you soon. Thanks, I'm coming man. out to van yeah. in a little bit and, uh, yeah, yeah, come man. Like we'll go out for breakfast. We'll, we'll have a barbecue. We'll do a fire by the beach. We'll have a whole day. Like, yo, the beach, the beach is right, right down the street. Um, give me a shout. We'll do man. Great to, great to meet you guys and yeah. see you guys and cheers. eh? Cheers. Hey, have a good one. I'll talk Bye. to you guys soon. Cheers. Bye.